Hey there, welcome back. Not going to lie, I definitely fangirled a little bit with today's interview. I am so excited I get to bring you Gretchen Rubin. Now, I'm assuming most of you know Gretchen. If you do not know who Gretchen Rubin is, oh my goodness, you are in for a treat. And I probably just got you to buy like seven books because (laughs) she is one of the best authors on books that come down to um, happiness and, and human nature. And just, she is a multiple New York times bestseller. Her, her biggest book probably is the happiness project. It sold more than a million copies. It's published in like, I think like 30 different languages. Um, it spent more than two years on the New York times bestseller list, um, including at number one. So she is just a wealth of knowledge. And one of the things that I, I brought up to her was, you know, the people that are listening to this, this podcast, I know you, you're, you're just like me. Right. And a lot of times in our business, we make sacrifices to experience the delayed gratification at a later date. And we think, well, if I just do this now, I'll be happier later. Right. We may not say happier, like I'll be more successful or be more, we'll make more money or, but really what we're looking for is happiness. Right. And we just keep pushing it off and pushing it off and pushing it off. And I had to learn at some point a long time ago, that I can't keep pushing it off, right? Because it's it's the, the milestone just keeps getting moved and moved and moved. And I think in here, you know, to really get to the idea of what does make you happy and how can you ex- start to experience that happiness more in your everyday life, no matter where you're at in your business phase or stage. So I really want you to take today's episode at heart. I definitely think if you have not read some of Gretchen's books, you may want to get started. Just pick one. She said you could start in any order. Pick one that feels like it's calling you the most and just get started because why else are we doing this, right? We're doing this to live happier, more fulfilled lives. And I think this is going to be a great episode for many of us to hear again if we've we've heard this message before. So enjoy Gretchen Rubin. Here we go. Gretchen, welcome to the show. I'm so excited to have you here today. I'm so happy to be talking to you. Well, speaking of happy, I was actually just going to say, when I think of you, it's hard to not think of the word happy, (laughs) happiness, right? You've written a lot of books and there's definitely a common theme. So I would love to hear how did that originally start? Like what made you want to head down that path? Well, it was a very inconspicuous moment of my life. I was finishing up a book uh, that was a biography of John F. Kennedy And uh, I had finished with the writing part of the book. So I had a little bit of loose mental energy and I was riding on a city bus in the pouring rain. So we were just inching along and I had one of those rare opportunities for reflection. So I was was looking out the window and I thought, well, what do I want from life anyway? And I thought, well, I want to be happy. Uh, But I realized in that moment, I never thought about whether I was happy, whether I thought I could be happier. Did I think it was even possible to make yourself happier? So I thought, you know, I should do a happiness project. And instantly I thought, oh my gosh, I have to learn more. And I ran out to the library and got a giant stack of books, ancient philosophy, contemporary science, anything I could get my hands on about how to be happier. Mm -hmm. And at first it was just for me. This was just a project that I was doing, Um, but it it, it was so fascinating and limitless. And there were so many things that I wanted to try um, that at a certain point I thought, wow, maybe this should be my next book. Mm -hmm. Um, And the subject is so fascinating that basically I've been studying different aspects of happiness and human nature ever since. I love it. And the fact that you have so many different books and variations on the same topic, it just shows you how much depth there is to this conversation. Yeah. I mean, I wrote a book better than before that was all about habit change, because if you start talking to people about happiness, what you realize is that Often they know, we know what would make us happier. We know we'd be happier if we got him more sleep or we saw our friends more, or we read more, or we ate healthier or whatever. Um, and so then it really becomes a question of like, well, how can we get ourselves to do the things that we want to do that we know would make us happier, healthier, more productive, more creative. So then that takes you right into habits. So that's how every one of my books is kind of a jumping off point the next for one. the next one. Cause I'm always like, oh, but there's there's something so else read to think them. about. So if we're bringing, and I'm sure people have heard of you, but in case somebody's like, what in the world? You, she's got such incredible books. You'll want to go and you're saying like, start from the beginning if they want to jump in to kind of. Oh, but you know, but like I wrote a little book called Outer Order, Inner Calm, which yeah. is all just about like creating outer order. Cause I was so, it's so striking to me how for me and for a lot of people, 
outer order contributes to inner calm yes. and, and energy more than you would think. Like, it's like, right. why does, why do I get such a charge out of cleaning out my closet? Or, or somebody said to me, I finally cleaned out my fridge and now I know I can switch careers. And I thought, <laughs> I know how that feels. Um, so I wrote a little book about that. So I think okay. it's whatever is most interesting to you. I wrote one called Happier at Home, which is really about our experience of home. It's hard to be happy if you're not happy at home. Um, yeah. But I think different people kind of come to it from, you know, I have a lot of people who read about habits because they're trying to, you know, they're trying to exercise more. Yeah. Um, it's not even that they're thinking specifically about happiness. So yeah, they, they don't have to be read in any particular order. I would assume the happier at home did very well during the pandemic. Yeah. Yeah, no, because people were spending a lot of time. Because you read it, home. you wrote it before the pandemic. Oh but... yeah, yeah, well before yes. the pandemic. Yes. Exactly. Oh wow, that's so funny. Okay, so I want to ask you, as you started on the journey for yourself, like what did you discover that maybe somebody could start to take a reflection or a look at themselves to discover, am I happy? What would make me happy? How do we get on that path? Well, that is a great question, and and one of the things about it is to, the first thing to realize is that we're all different. Mm -hmm. um, you're unique, just like everybody else. And so we really have to build our own happiness projects on the foundation of our own interests, our own nature, our own temperament, our own values. Um, the, you know, I think people, uh, and I certainly know this feeling where you want to like download a one page PDF yes. shortcut highlights from the internet and just like follow it. But it really is so different for people. And so I think the first thing to do is to really is to think about yourself and what makes you happier. And so, and then, and then try to be guided by that as much as you can. So for instance, a lot of people, you know, there's morning people and night people. This is a real thing. It's largely genetically determined at a function of age. And yet so many night people are sort of like, wow, I should, what's wrong with me that I can't just like get up at 6 a.m. and go for a three mile run before work the way other people do. It's like, yeah. well, you're a night person. That's not gonna work very well for you because mm -hmm. you're at your most productive and creative and energetic later in the day. So I think the big thing is to really think about yourself. Um, uh, what works for you? What doesn't work for you? What appeals to you? What excites you? I mean, I think, you know, on, a, on the one hand, we want to accept ourselves on another, but at the same time, we want to expect more from ourselves. But each of us has to figure out, like, where is that? Yeah. point. Um, so I think it really starts with self-knowledge. Yeah. I love that. Well, and like you said, everybody wants the cheat sheet and there's an abundance amount of cheat sheets online where we there feel are. we must have the morning routine and we yes. must wake up at five o'clock and we must yeah. do all the things yeah. which can, like you said, if somebody's not a morning person that can not be great for them. There is a fa fascinating book called daily rituals by Mason Curry. And I don't know. I, I don't like the title daily rituals because really it's just a, 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 an examination of people's habits. And it's all, it's philosophers, scientists, artists, writers, choreographers, like all people, you know, immensely successful people. And what you see is some people stay up late and some people get up early and some people drink coffee and some people drink vodka and some people work all alone and some people work in the middle of a busy studio. But what you realize is that all these people have figured out what they need mm. to do what they need to get done. And they make sure they create the environment that allows them to do their best work. Mm -hmm. And so it's not about figuring out like, well, what's the best way? What's the right way? And then like following that, but it's really to say, well, what do I need? Like, I think about this, speaking of outer order, yeah. some people love profusion and collections and buzz and piles, a lot going on. And, and then some people are like, oh, you know, a cluttered desk means a cluttered mind. Well, maybe for you, yeah. but not for somebody else. And okay. so if you like to work that way, don't let somebody tell you, oh no, you'd be so much more productive if you had nothing on your desk except a, right. a pencil and like a little pad of paper, because maybe you wouldn't work that way mm. best. You know, it's really to figure out what works for you. Yeah. Oh, so good. Now it's easy. It's easier when you're sitting with yourself and your thoughts than when you're on social and you're checking out what everybody else is doing and, yeah. and how they're doing it, all the things. What do you tell somebody that probably is on there a little too much obsessing over how everybody else is doing it and what's making them happy. And now they think they have to have that thing or that vacation or that yeah, lifestyle. Yeah. yeah well, this is called social comparison and people are definitely like, some people are just like more attuned to social comparison. So a very easy thing is to just sort of limit your access. Like if you're somebody who's drawn to it, you're probably spending quite a lot of time on it. They usually mm -hmm. go together. And so one thing is to say like, well, you know, and I think many, some people are sort of like, well, you should just get off of it altogether. But I think many people don't want to get off of it altogether. Right. It, it's a useful tool in business. It's, it's a helpful mm -hmm. tool in life. 
Um, but to say how much of it this is good for me, and then at what point does it start being uh, a draining distraction or it's pushing out other values. So like, I don't have time to read books because I'm spending so much time scrolling through social media. So to really feel, figure out what is that amount of time for you? Um, and then whether you, uh, like I have an app, the happier app where you can yeah. use to sort of like hold, they like don't break the chain. You know, how many days have you only looked at it for half an hour? Mm -hmm. There's all different kinds of tools that you can use. Um, and I'm sure people are familiar with them, yeah. um, to, to limit that. Okay. Um, and one thing, another thing I would say, this is part of better than before is that to a like hilarious degree, we're so much more likely to do something if it's even slightly more convenient and less likely to do something if it's less convenient. And one of the things you can do with social media is you can like, like physically put your phone mm -hmm. in another room. And here, like, let me look. Um, okay, so I turned my phone um, to grayscale. Okay. So it's in black and white. So it's just ugly. It's harder to use it. It's less convenient because it's like looking at an old black and white TV set. Okay. Um, it's harder to see what you're supposed to click. It's harder to find mm. the app you're looking for. Photographs are, are much less interesting. And so mm. it just makes it harder. It's less convenient. It's less pleasant for me to use this. And so that's another way um, to, to kind of ease yourself away from it. Yeah, so good. Yeah. I, I would love, you, you mentioned your app. Let's talk about what sparked that, why you, why you thought after all of these amazing books, okay, this is where I want to head with this. You know, one of the things I, I really believe sort of, you know, in my core, I'm a writer, but one mm -hmm. of the things I've known is like, you want to reach people wherever they are engaging with ideas and yes. people are like, are very different in how they like to have ideas. Some people want to listen to an audiobook; They don't want to read, like that's how they take in information. Um, some people want to watch a video and a lot of people want to use an app. And um, it, when I was writing about habits, um, I, I figured out this framework that divides people into four categories, upholders, questioners, obligers, and rebels. And knowing your tendency makes it very much easier to figure out what kind of approach is going to work for you. Mm -hmm. And so I thought, well, there are all these habit apps, but they don't, they don't really take you into account. Mm -hmm. They're not, they're, they're not very, they're not helping you to get where you need to go. They're just sort of giving general advice, uh, which may or may not work. It's kind of throwing the spaghetti against the wall. So I was very intrigued by how an app, um, you know, the happier app could help people, you know, they can choose anything that works for them because you would never say never, but kind of lead them to the kind of tools that are mm. typically work for the kind of tendency that they are. Yeah. So good. So you just made me think of, of this too, as we're, we're talking a lot of negative things happening in the world, right. With yeah. scary things, people are, are yeah. starting to get really anxious and fearful. How do we remain happy, find our happy when some not great things are happening or going around and all of that. Well, I mean, back to the thing you raised before about like social media, um, like I'm a big fan of reading news. Like, it, I mean, I am so old school, like I still get a newspaper yes. um, or, you know, like spending a certain amount of time on news, but, or, or like not reading the comments um, or reading, um, first of all, watching it on TV, often there's like music and it's, it's meant to like yes. elicit very strong emotion. Um, so the more you're reading and the more kind of that reading is very kind of straightforward because you need the information. We all need to be civically educated. Um, but you do not, you know, often people get drawn deeper and deeper and deeper into it. And, and, you know, at a certain, it's kind of, kind of potato chip news. You've got it, you've got the taste in your mouth and you want more and more and more, but mm -hmm. you are not getting nutrition from that. Like you're right. not actually learning more and becoming more educated or nuanced. You're just sort of like going deeper and deeper. And so I think it's to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I do think that for all of us, uh, you know, sometimes people say to me, you know, look in a world that's so full of suffering and injustice, is it even morally appropriate for me to think mm -hmm. about my own happiness? Because there's all this going on, but it's interesting what research shows. And I think, you know, just thinking about the people in your own life shows this to be true is that happier people are more interested in the problems of other people. And they're more interested in the problems of the world. And when we're happier, we have the emotional wherewithal to turn outward and to think about the pain of the world and, mm -hmm. and like how we might be involved. Whereas when we're less happy, we tend to become isolated and defensive and preoccupied with our own problems. And so, you know, if you're thinking, oh, well, you know, it, I shouldn't do things like 
turn off the TV, get enough sleep, you know, all these things to manage my own happiness, because what does it matter in the face of everything else? It's like, well, actually, you're going to be much better able to participate in the world if you're happier. I mean, happier people are more likely to vote. They're more likely to donate money. They're more likely to help out if a family member or colleague or a friend needs their hand. They donate more time. They have healthier habits. They make better team members and better leaders. Yeah. Um, so it really is worthwhile to... Um, yeah to take the time to work on our own happiness. Absolutely. I mean, and who would you rather be around? I mean, that's, I don't think anybody's going to say (laughs) an unhappy person, right? It's very energizing. And that's part of why they're good team members and better leaders because they are more, people are kind of drawn to that. Um, And in fact, one of the things that you see is that sometimes for happier people, they almost have like these, these leeches that get attached Mm -hmm. to them that are like sucking off their energy yeah. Um, they can find that to be very burdensome um, mm-hmm. because it's easy for people to think like, oh, well, you're just naturally like that. Um, right. They don't realize how much they're using their person as like a buffer, a cushion, or kind of like a little electrical charge. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, so good. Now, if something is directly happening, they're going through an emotional crisis, something that's happening in their family, how do you go back to finding your happy when something is directly affecting you, your life, your family members, your loved ones? Well, the thing is, there's many times in our lives where we we wouldn't seek to be happy. I mean, it's not appropriate to feel happy. If your mother's in the hospital, it's like you're not going to feel happy. And it's and it's really important to re, to recognize that the, the role that negative emotions play in a happy life, and also emotions like guilt, regret, boredom, resentment, anger, righteous indignation, all of these have a really important role to play in our lives. So I think sometimes people think like, well, if you try to be happy, what you want to be is like on the 10 scale of happiness, you wanna be at 10, 24 seven, and it's not realistic and it's not even a good life. Mm. So I think part of it is to say, well, how can I be as happy as I can be given the circumstances and the reality of you know, what's going on? Mm. And so let's take the, the idea of your mother in the hospital. Like one thing you could do is you could say, I'm not gonna let myself get burned out and like stay up all night and stay at the hospital 24 hours. I'm gonna make sure that I get enough sleep because I'm actually going to be more useful if I'm Mm -hmm. not burned out, not overwhelmed, not drained, not getting sick myself because I'm just like, you know, been burning the candle at both ends. And so it's to say like, well, given what's going on, you know, what can I do um, sort of to take care of my own energy, my own health and my, you know, my own mood. Mm -hmm. There are things also that you can do. um, This sounds funny, um, but you can schedule time to worry. Um, a lot of times when you're worried, you're kind of overwhelmed with worry. You wake yeah. up in the middle of the night with worry and kind of ruminating all the time. So you just say, and depending on how much worry you have to do, maybe it's once a week, maybe it's once a day, you pick a, a good time of day, not right before bed. Yeah. Um, and you say, I'm just going to sit down with a pen and paper and I'm just going to worry. And if I think of something I need to do, I'm going to write it down. And otherwise I'm just going to worry. And what that does is then it frees up the other time not to worry. Because you're mm-hmm. like, I'm not pretending that this isn't happening. I'm not denying anything. I've set aside time and I'll worry about it when the time comes. Um, and then in between, I'm I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna worry. Mm-hmm. And um, a lot of times that really helps people manage like kind of the overwhelming quality sometimes that comes from yeah. from those well, those feelings. Right. And then you you are giving time to actually sit with it and think yes, about it and feel absolutely. it. Which is valuable. I mean, this is mm-hmm. it's a very valuable emotion. Anxiety is very valuable because it's like this is what's got you like playing out all the what ifs and doing yeah. all the preparation and thinking like, well, I should get this done now because maybe it'll be too late later. I mean, it's meant to be helpful. And even the feelings of anxiety that we feel like the um and in fact there's a lot of uh, a lot of people have have written about there is a lot of upside to anxiety and, and, and in many ways it is the body trying to help us. So the feelings that we feel can be, uh, can become negative. And if like we feel them all the time, it can become counterproductive, but it's meant to like help you focus, uh, disregard your feelings of pain or hunger, you know, because you've got something that like, has got to take all your attention. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, you know, you, I sort of remind this to my, my children when they're taking a test, like, being nervous is your body trying to help you. It's saying like, let's like, we got, we got a, a priority here that we got to pay attention to, mm-hmm. you know, or okay. even saying, instead of saying I, like, I'm anxious to say like, I'm excited. Oh, I'm giving mm-hmm. a big keynote. I'm really excited. I feel the excitement. Like, yeah, I, I can feel it in my body. I'm very excited. Just sometimes a change of vocabulary can help us sort of 
mm -hmm. uh, illuminate a different aspect of an experience. Yeah, I, lo I love the change in the vocabulary, especially with children, right? Like when they're bringing up the nerves and all of that to explain that to them. I love that. Yeah, now, one thing I say with my daughter is yeah. you were rattled mm. because I feel like rattled is sort of like, it's minor, it's transient. It's like, it explains like why you kind of like got all up in your yeah. head, but rattled sounds, sounds very manageable. Yes. Whereas something like, well, you're feeling very anxious. That sounds mm. sort of more, at least to me, yeah. And people have their own views about different vocabulary words, which is why we all need to kind of come up with our own vocabulary. Yeah. But that to me sounds more like, well, that test was hard. Like you got rattled when you saw that part that you didn't know. And like, mm -hmm. okay. It also but, sounds temporary. Like it sounds temporary. Yeah. Like it's over now. You're fine. Yeah. yeah. And next time, mm -hmm. like maybe you won't be rattled. You were uh, something unexpected happened and you were rattled, yeah. you know? Um, and so it's not denying a feeling. It's not telling somebody like everything's fine or you're never going to feel that way again but maybe it's a vocabulary choice that feels a little bit more manageable. Mm, yeah. So good. A lot of the listeners are small business owners. Yes. So a lot of times we are really good at sacrifice and we're really good at delayed gratification. We, yeah. we will, you know, do something now to be happier later, but the yeah. problem is we are also wired to continue to move the milestone. <laughs> so we yeah. never get there to enjoy it. Right? right. You know, you're five years in 10 years in 20 years in, what do you want to say to people listening who are doing that to themselves? Well, there's a couple of things. Okay. One is a to-da list because all your listeners, I'm sure are make amazing to-do lists, Yeah. but give yourself a prompt. Maybe it's New Year's Eve. Maybe it's the anniversary of your business. Maybe it's your birthday. Maybe it's the first day of spring, whatever is kind of speaks to you um, and have a to-da list. Um, and look back um, or, you know, I have some friends where we do this every year together we spend one, a couple of hours, one day going back through everything that's happened in the previous year. And then we meet like a week later and do what we hope will come up in the year to come. And what's astonishing is the whole time, the two hours when we're talking about what we did in the past, we're like, I can't believe how much I did. You right. know, so much, you forget and you don't give yourself credit and you don't realize how far you've come because you're just looking forward and you don't realize like, wow, like, look what I did in one year. Look what I did during, even under the pandemic situation or like, you know, it's, it's it, so give yourself that ta-da along with the to-do. Um, another thing is uh, give yourself accountability even for things that are fun. Like if you're really good at meeting all the priorities uh, for other people, if you're, you know, your clients, your customers, your students, if you're really good at doing that, if you feel like, okay, I meet my promises to other people, but I'm not keeping my promises to myself by like, quitting work at a certain hour, taking time on the weekends, taking vacations, you know, making time for exercise or friends or reading or whatever it might be. Give yourself outer accountability, even for that. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm talking outer accountability, not things like setting a priority or putting yourself first or trying to get motivated. I'm talking about outer accountability. Um, then this goes to my four tendencies framework, which if people want to know more about that, they can go yeah. to GretchenRubin.com slash four tendencies. And there's a whole thing about why obligers um, need outer accountability. Okay. Um, and, uh, and another thing I think people can do when, when they, when they aren't, um, they aren't uh, kind of understand, giving themselves enough credit uh, for how far they've come um, is to really uh, think of like, well, what is your identity? Um, you know, and like, well, my identity is that I'm a, you know, I'm a forward thinking entrepreneur, or I'm, I'm a creative person who's figured out a get, way to get paid for my work, or, you know, whatever that is, and really think like, well, what am I doing to put those values into the world? And that's often very, very gratifying and kind of keeps you tied to your, your deepest values and purpose. Yeah. So good. So you've, you brought up the four tendencies. Can yeah. we talk about that a little bit? Oh yeah. I love talking about okay. four tendencies. All right, amazing. So yeah, share what the four tendencies are. Okay. So this is looking at a very narrow aspect of your nature, but it's very significant. So it's how you respond to expectations. So we all face two kinds of expectations, outer expectations, like a work deadline and inner expectations, like my own desire to write a novel in my free time. Mm -hmm. So depending on whether we meet or resist outer and inner expectations, that's what makes us an upholder, a questioner, an obliger, or a rebel. 
So upholders readily meet outer and inner expectations. They meet the work deadline. They keep the New Year's resolution without much fuss. They want to know what other people expect from them, but their expectation for themselves are just as important. Mm -hmm. So their motto is discipline is my freedom. <laughs> then there are that questions. That would be me for okay. sure. Okay, <laughs> okay. Then that's you and me both. We're up, which is yes. unusual. It's pretty rare tendency. Okay as you know, from mm -hmm. life experience. Yep. Um, then there are questioners. Questioners question all expectations. They'll do it if they think it makes sense. So they resist anything arbitrary, unjustified, irrational. Um, they need to know why. They tend to love research and customization. Um, so they're making everything an inner expectation. If mm -hmm. it meets their inner standard as making good sense, they'll do it no problem. If it fails their standard, they will push back. So their motto is, I'll comply if you convince me why. Mm. Then there are obligers. Obligers readily meet outer expectations, but they struggle to meet inner expectations. And I got my first insight into this when a friend said to me, I don't understand it. When I was in high school, I was on the track team and I never missed track practice. So why can't I go running now? Well, when she had a team and a coach expecting her to show up, she had no problem. But when she was trying to go on her own, it's a struggle. And again, as I said, when someone's an obliger, you know, if you want to read more, join a book group. If you want to exercise more, work out with a trainer, work out with a friend who's annoyed if you don't show up, raise money for a charity, take your dog for a run who's so disappointed if he doesn't get to go for a run. Think of your duty to your future self. Think of your duty to be a role model for others. There are so many ways to create outer accountability once you know that's what you need. Mm -hmm. um, so their motto is, you can count on me and I'm counting on you to count on me. Nice. And then the final category is rebel and rebels resist all expectations outer and inner alike. They want to do what they want to do in their own way, in their own time. They can do anything they want to do that they choose to do. But if you ask or tell them to do something, they're very likely to resist. And typically they don't tell themselves what to do. Like they don't sign up for a 10 a.m. yoga class on Saturday because they think, well, I just don't know what I'm going to feel like doing on Saturday. And having it on my calendar is just going to annoy me. Um, so their motto is, you can't make me and neither can I. Nice. <laughs> um, and the thing about the tendencies, and this is, this is useful to know for yourself, but then also as you're thinking about your clients and your customers, right. is that the biggest tendency is the obliger tendency. You either are an obliger, you have many obligers in your life. So maybe you're managing yourself as an obliger, or maybe you, have, you're, you need to create uh, communications or deal with somebody who's an obliger, you want to know how kind of like how to set them up for success, mm -hmm. which is very different from if they're a rebel or a questioner or a holder. Yeah. Um, the second largest is questioner. The smallest is rebel. It's conspicuous, but pretty small. But our tendency, Stacy, <laughs> the upholder tendency is only slightly larger. So we're okay. part of the kind of extreme fringe personality type. All right. I'm usually in the rare personality type. Oh, there you go. Test. Yes. There you go. Um, and I can definitely see that the obliger, I think, you know, even coaching certain people, yes, they exactly. will do something when I'm asking, but if I'm not asking or, or, or they, it's on them, they keep procrastinating until I say, could I see this? No, but, and that's exactly right. And that's why I think obligers do so well with coaches because yeah. what they need is the outer accountability. And yeah. so, um, but, but then you can see how rebels often do, like they don't do well with coaches because they don't like that feeling of somebody telling them what to do or, right. or, or looking over their shoulder. And well, I should and say, if you, if, if you want to take a quiz, a lot of you, I think most people know what they are right away. We can yeah. do game of Thrones characters. Like this is very obvious once you know what to look for, but some people really do like to take it test and like get a, res mm -hmm. a report, you can go to GretchenRubin.com slash four tendencies, F-O-U-R tendencies. And it's like three and a half million people have taken. It's a free short quiz. Um, and it'll tell you what you are. I did take it, but I was like, I know I'm an upholder, but I'm going to see what the questions are. Cause I like yeah. to, I like to get that info, Yeah, but no, I've, I've definitely worked with rebels yeah. and I think to myself, why are you paying me? <laughs> Every yeah. time I tell you something, you don't want to do it, but yet you keep paying me, but uh, you can tell. Yeah. I mean, and that's why I think it is really val valuable to know the tendencies, yes. because if you know that you could say some, you could like redirect your communications on mm -hmm. um, that. Maybe it wouldn't, it wouldn't ignite that spirit of resistance yeah. or maybe, or at least you wouldn't blame yourself and think, why can't I reach this person? You'd be like, well, this, this person doesn't want to be told what to do. Yeah. even though they've hired me, it's kind of like, well, you're not the boss of me, even if you are the boss of me, you right. know what I mean? It's like, you're paying me to tell you what to do, but you don't want to do anything that somebody tells you to do. Mm -hmm. It's just like, that's just a conundrum that, you know, um, it's not like, 
you can fix that with like, you know, a different kind of email drip. You know what I mean? You have to, you have to have a whole different way of thinking about that. There are definitely ways to work with rebels for rebels themselves to work with themselves or rebels uh, or for other people to work with rebels, but you really do have to think about the rebel tendency and take that into account. Yeah, for sure. Now, um, I really like to give like a tangible, like tactical thing to do at the end. Like I love for people to get something to walk away with and actually implement What is something that they could get started on this journey? Oh, I love this question. And, you know, I have a podcast happier with Gretchen Rubin, and we always have a try this at home in every episode, because I think it's just such a great, um, a great thing. I would say that, um, and this is so basic, but it it is so basic, um, but we need it, which is to get some exercise. Mm. Um, Exercises like the magical elixir of life. Um, it both calms us down and energizes us. us. Uh, if you're having trouble sleeping, it'll help you fall asleep faster and sleep more deeply. Especially if you go out, if you go out in the daylight, especially early morning light, it will help your circadian rhythm, you know, which is so important to the body. We're just only now understanding how light is so important to, to the mm-hmm. body. Um, it will give you energy. It will improve your mood. It will boost yeah. your creativity and your, in your mood and your focus. I mean, the good news is you don't have to do a lot of exercise. You do not have to like train for the marathon. Um, Even something like a 20 minute walk can make a big, big difference. Um, One of the um, habit strategies that works really well for walking is pairing. And pairing is when you choose something that you like to do and you only do it with something that you really want yourself to do. So if you have a favorite podcast that you love, mm-hmm. say, I, or an audio book that you know, you, you're loving listening to, say, I'm only going to do it if I'm walking, it's not a reward. It's just that it only happens when I'm walking. And I've talked to so many people who are like, oh my gosh, like I found this excellent comedy podcast yep. and now I'm going on twice as long of walks because I want to, I don't want to have to turn it, off the right. podcast. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, um, so that, so to, to like pair, mm-hmm. pair something like a podcast or, um, an audio book, mm-hmm. uh, with something like walking. Yeah. So good. I love walking. I'm in Wisconsin and oh. Beautiful. Unfortunately, in the middle of winter, walking it, is not fun. It's cold. Yeah. And I will tell you this year, I discovered how much I really just need to be outside, even if it's nine mm-hmm. degrees. So right. I just bought the craziest outdoor gear and I probably walked it like once or twice a week. And I really feel like this was the, the easiest winter for me to get through. And I think it had to do with being outside, going mm. on walks, taking that time to just get outside sometimes. Well, I mean, what do they say? There's no good weather, just bad clothes. Uh, I, I mean, there's no bad, yeah, no bad weather, just bad yeah. clothes. Um, and I think that's true. And I don't know about you, but I kind of feel like I like to experience the weather, even when it's really, really bad weather. There's something refreshing about yeah. like experiencing it. And there's a kind of staleness if you're just sort of inside all the time yeah. uh, and you don't have like the breeze in your face and like mm-hmm. hear the sounds of outside and kind of be moving through space. Yeah. I, I agree. Um, this is, you know, one of the things people say, well, money can't buy happiness and money can't buy happiness, but money can buy many things that contribute a lot to happiness. Mm-hmm. And if something is going to help you be outside and enjoy the outdoors, mm-hmm. I mean, that's a really good place to spend a little money, you know, go to a camping store or whatever and a ski store and say like, I'm not skiing down a mountain, but I need, you know, I wear snow pants, you know, right. in my house sometimes because mm-hmm. I get really cold. And so I yeah. think that's a great idea. Yeah. Get what you need to do what you need to do to be happier. Yeah. Love that. Where can people find your books, find your app, any place you want to share your podcast? Oh yeah. So if you go to my website, GretchenRubin.com, that's sort of like a great, uh, like a uh, hub for everything I've got going. Um, you can go to the happier app, just go, just search for the happier app.com. Um, my podcast is called happier with Gretchen Rubin. That's everywhere you listen to your podcast. I'm on social media and all the usual places, um, in Gretchen Rubin. And, um, again, on my website, if you want to read more about my books, or you want to read an excerpt, or uh, I also have a lot of resources there. It's on GretchenRubin.com. Um, and that's also where you can take the quiz. Um, if you want to take that quiz or, or send it what a lot of people want to do is they want to send, send it to somebody else. They're like, Mm -hmm. I think I understand what the problem is now um, between us. Um, You know, so that's what you can send someone else to the quiz as well. Love it. Gretchen, thank you for taking the time to be here today. Such a good conversation. Thank you. Oh, I I feel like we could talk all day. We're interested in so many of the same things. Thank you.